Okay, so let's talk about how to protect a home from an EMP or solar storm. So the first part of it is you have to understand what the threat is, all right? And so let's say there's an EMP that occurs very high in the atmosphere, or maybe a solar event, some kind of coronal mass ejection that comes towards the Earth. Its primary effect of either one of those is going to be to inject a very large amount of energy onto long conductors, such as power lines. Now, once that energy couples into those power lines, it's going to flow in all directions. And that means it's going to come down through the transformer system and into your home. And anything that's plugged into the outlets in your home then might potentially be damaged by that very powerful surge of energy. So that occurs both from a solar storm or an EMP. Now an EMP also has an added threat of a very high frequency component that not only couples into long conductors but also couples into small conductors, such as even your cell phone or anything, you know, your computers, those type of things. And, and that has to be addressed slightly differently, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But so you need to understand the primary threat is the conducted energy that comes in from the power lines into your home. And you'd like to address that in some way. All right, now, if you look at the actual waveform generated by, let's say, an EMP, it has three different components, all right? They call them E1, E2, and E3. And the E1 event is the initial really fast surge of energy. Um, it occurs in the nanosecond kind of time frames. That's very, very fast. The E2 event is spread out over, let's say, microseconds of time. And then the E3 event is over milliseconds or even seconds or minutes. So it's a very long duration type event. And to have a true system that protects your home, it has to address all three of those, okay? So let's talk about how we might do that. All right, so there are basically three steps to protecting your home, all right? And I'll walk you through these, and there's a lot to know about each of these, um, but I'll do my best to just sort of give you a quick overview, and you can ask questions if you have some. So the first thing is you want to put a good whole house surge protection device on your home. All right, it usually mounts right next to the breaker box in your garage. Sometimes they're mounted outside, um, but it goes, it connects into your breaker panel. Okay, so a good whole house surge protection device. Now, what do I mean by a good whole house one? What's good mean? Well, I came up with a list of six different metrics that I think are important. Okay, you may disagree and have other metrics, but I'll talk to you about why I think these are important and this is what you should look for. And in particular, I'll point out one specific surge protection device that I found after surveying the market that meets all of these and I think does a fantastic job, all right? So the first one is get one that's UL1449 listed, all right? That just means it's been properly tested for safety. This is hugely important because if you get one that's not UL1449 listed, it might not be, it might void your homeowner's warranty. They might claim that you put something on your home that wasn't approved, okay? So make sure it's UL1449 listed. It has to offer the complete protection for your home. That means it has to protect line to line, line to neutral, line to ground, and neutral to ground. Right? It has to protect all those different sort of uh, paths by which the current could flow. Because right? you don't know where the energy is coming in on. It may come in on one line, both lines, neutral. You're not sure. All right? So you'd like to, to get a surge protection device that has all of those parts of protection. Um, some, some surge protection devices may only offer a portion of those. So again, look for that. Again, my recommendation is to find one that offers all that protection. The second is look for one that's rated with an I nominal or I sub N of 20,000 amps. That's the most that UL will rate a surge protection device to. Um, so look for one that has that rating. That means it's, it can take a, a, a repeated number of surges at that current rating and still survive. Okay. And then next, look for one that has a really large maximum possible surge current, something greater than 100,000 amps. Because again, we're going to get a really big bunch of current coming through this. And there's another reason for this I'll talk about in just a minute. So something that has a greater than 100,000 amps of maximum surge current, right? Ideally, I like them if they have 10 gauge wire wired to them. Some of them come with smaller gauge wire. I like the 10 gauge wire just because it's, uh, it has more standard can uh, current capacity. And, and again, there's a reason for that as well, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then finally, if it has some kind of a warning, either a flashing light or an audible warning is even better, in my opinion, um, that's nice because then you know if the part has failed. You don't think you're being protected and in fact it might have failed six months ago due to a lightning strike or something. So have some kind of an audible warning to tell you, hey, the device has become faulty, all right? So these are the metrics I think are important if you were going to pick a surge protection device. And I'm sure there are a number that meet this. Um, there's one in particular I found that's fantastic. It meets all of these easily. Uh, and I'll talk about that after I get done talking about the general uh, recommendations. Okay, so those are the steps there to find a good whole house surge protection device. Now, I mentioned that, that this number four uh, and number five, there was another reason to look at those besides just surviving the event. 
And that is because when you're looking to survive the E3 event, that's a long duration surge, right? Maybe the, the power lines go from their nominal 120 volts into your house, maybe up to 300 volts or 350 volts. You want something that can draw the current into it, a surge protection device that can draw the current into it when you get over voltage like that and survive long enough that it will actually overcurrent the breakers feeding your home and it will trip those breakers, right? Now the only way that happens, I've done a number of tests on this, the only way that happens is if you have something that can take a huge amount of current, right? And so that's why I say the 100,000 amps is really important. You can draw 100,000 amps into the home very briefly and pop the upstream breakers on your home and disconnect your home from the rest of this E3 surge that might be present, okay? And that's really important to surviving the EMP event or a coronal mass ejection. They both have that E3 component. All right, so that's uh, important for that reason. And the 10 gauge wire is the same reason, um, is that if you have the higher gauge wire, you can draw that current for longer without heating up the wire, okay? So that, the reason these are really important, in my opinion, is not just to survive the E1, but to survive the E3, okay? All right, so a good whole house surge protection device. We'll talk more about which ones I recommend in a minute. The second is, is a special uh, recommendation um, that you won't see in other places probably, and that is that you need a very high frequency ferrite placed on the line one, the line two, and either the neutral or ground or both if you have them coming into your breaker panel, all right? So there are a number of ferrites out there, and they're just little, I'll show you them in, in just a minute, but they're little clamp-on parts or they're little parts that you roll out the wire through, they're little toroids. And the idea behind them is that um, you put current through the wire and you generate a magnetic field through this toroid and the toroid would try and resist changes in that current. The ferrite tries to resist current changes. And by doing that, it essentially would suppress some of these peaks, all right? And it also helps spread them out in time. Now, that's fantastic. And if this were a complete solution, you could just put it on your home and call it a day. Um, but it really only works for these very high frequency type events. So in this case, it would be E1, all right? So this very high frequency ferrite is to address E1. And what it's going to do is it's going to lower the level and it's gonna spread it out in time. Now, what does that do? That enables your surge protection device to actually turn on and shunt the energy away, all right? Now, without this ferrite, the surge protection device just doesn't generally have enough time to turn on and take that energy away. Because again, this might be a few, mil a few nanoseconds of rise time. And it's, if you calculate out the times to get the energy to get to your surge protection device, it's already present by the time the surge protection device can turn on. So this ferrite actually stops it as it comes in the home. And I'll show you how that's done in just a minute, all right? So a very high frequency ferrite, and I put a little asterisk, it has to be a very special ferrite that won't saturate, all right? If this was such an easy solution, everybody would just put one on. The way that it works is you put the ferrite around, either the, around the line one, the line two, and either the neutral or ground. Each one of them gets their own individual ferrite. And as long as the ferrite doesn't saturate, it will suppress those transients that come in on those lines, okay? Very effective. The problem is that our home draws lots and lots of current all day long, and so there's current flowing through those wires all day. And if you put too much current through it, you generate a magnetic uh, field in the ferrite that saturates it. The flux density is sort of peaked out. You can't get any more, and that means it's no longer effective. All right? And in fact, if you run the numbers, the current that you're drawing through your house every day will saturate every ferrite on the market that I know of. All right? So in other words, the ferrite's not going to work for you. If you put it on, it'll just get saturated by your home current, and when the pulse comes in, it'll just come straight in, all right? So you have to modify, you have to get a very special material ferrite, all right? I looked at maybe 500 different ferrites and narrowed down to the one that I think is the very best. And then you have to modify it in a very special way to get it to do what you want it to do where it won't saturate, all right? Again, I'll talk about that at the end. All right, so this is very important to address E1. It's the only way I know of really to address E1, uh, and you do it right at the input to the house, and that's the way I would recommend doing it, all right? Finally, if you have worries about, let's say you have very sensitive electronics in your home, uh, like computers, maybe you know, uh, radios, those type of things, that you're worried about the energy coupling into the home's wires, right? the actual house wires, this E1 event coming into the house wires and then propagating into those devices, not coming in the power lines, but actually going through the air and uh, getting into the devices that way, you'd want to put small broadband ferrites on the cords to those sensitive electronics. Now, these are easy to find. You just look for good broadband ferrites. I have a number for sale on disasterprepare.com, but you can look around and find some that you like. And the main thing is you just find them with the right diameter where they'll clip around your power cords, okay? And they go around the entire power cord when you do that. All right, so again, this is to address E1 coupling into the house wire. All right, so this is the overall solution. Now, I'm gonna talk about some specifics in just a minute. But the idea is good whole house surge protection device that meets these requirements, 
uh, very high frequency ferrite. Again, it's tricky in its own right to get the right one. And then these small broadband ferrites to address the E1 coupling into the house wires, right? That's the solution. Let's talk about the specifics. Okay, so let's take a look at this solution when it's actually applied to your house, all right? So what I've done is I've drawn a breaker panel and I've drawn a power meter here. Uh, now typically between the power meter and the breaker panel there are typically three wires. There's a line one, a line two, and a combined neutral slash ground. Now in some cases if your meter is further away or if your electrical code is a little different, they may require separate neutral and grounds coming over from the power meter, right? So I've shown it with three wires coming in, but in some cases I think it's not very common anymore, but there are four wires that could come in. So line one comes in and attaches to one side, line two comes in and attaches to the other. They then feed a, a series of breakers that are all sort of interconnected. Um, the neutral and ground can come in and attach to these little bars, these little bus bars inside of them. All right? So I've shown like a neutral bus bar and a ground bus bar, but sometimes they're one and the same. All right? So when you go and you have the surge protection device installed, and I recommend having an electrician do that, even though the work is very easy to do, you just attach it to this breaker uh, and to these bus bars, um, it's, I recommend having an electrician do it for, for one, for safety, right? You don't want to electrocute yourself. And also, if something were to ever happen later and somebody claimed it was because your surge protection device was improperly installed, you could at least show that you had a professional put it on, all right? So I think that's important. All right, so you install a surge protection device by just attaching it up to the neutral and ground bus bars and then the, the breakers, okay? The line one line to attach to the breakers, all right? So easy enough to do. Now, the ferrites, um, again, there are a number of different kind of ferrites you can buy of all different materials. You see material code 31 and 44 and on and on. You can look at all these different material codes and they all have different frequency characteristics, but they also have different saturation characteristics. But even if you buy the best one out there, the material that's highest frequency and that was most unlikely to saturate, it will still saturate in this application. There's just too much current flowing through these wires feeding into your home that even before the EMP arrives, the, the part will already be saturated and so it won't affect the EMP pulse that comes in and that would be very unfortunate. So what you have to do is you have to buy a very special ferrite and then you have to custom modify it, all right? And those would then be attached one ferrite per wire that feeds in and you'd want to do it right before it feeds into the breaker system, all right? So it would be essentially trying to filter anything that came in from that, the external world, all right? Any surges that came in on those lines, whether it's neutral ground or whether it's line one or line two or any combination of them, it would try and suppress those, all right? Now, some people might argue, well, I'll just get one giant ferrite and stick it around the entire bundle of wires. And for some applications, that would work okay. For this application, however, I don't think it's the best solution. And the reason is that we don't really know which line is going to be injected with the most energy. They may not all be symmetrical. Not all of them may get the same energy. And that will not be suppressed by a single common ferrite, all right? Whereas if you can get individual ferrites, and if they don't saturate, they will suppress any transient that comes in on any of those lines. So that's the best solution if you can get them to not saturate, all right? So this is how it's installed. You get ferrites around each of those wires and you install the surge protection device. Now the good news is I found a ferrite of the right material, and it's a very unique material, and I figured out a way to custom modify it where it will not saturate for each of those. Plus, it's actually a clamp-on ferrite, which is beautiful because then you don't have to remove these heavy-duty wires and kill the main power, you can have the electrician install these right around the wires. They just clip right around the wires, right? You don't have to get any, you know, pull them out or anything like that. You can just clip them right around the wires. And they can be clipped anywhere at, before the point where they attach to the main breaker, all right? So those wires will feed in there and route, and you just find a spot and you have them clipped around each of those wires. So again, you'd need three ferrites if you have three wires. You'd need four ferrites if you have four wires, right? So you'd want to double check that before ordering them, all right? So this is the general solution. I just wanted to show you how it is done. And finally, I'm going to talk just a little bit about my recommended surge protection device. Okay, so we talked about what the general solution method was and how it would be installed at the home. Let's talk about some specifics of actual components, all right? So I looked at, I don't know, 20 or so different surge protection devices on the market, and I found one that I really like that meets all of the metrics I outlined earlier. And that one is the Siemens first surge 140, 140, okay? The 140 is because it, it has a rating of 140,000 amps max capacity. Now that is really high. That's much higher than most surge protection devices. And again, the reason that's important is that it allows the, the product to draw a great deal of current before being damaged. And the, the goal of that in an EMP or a solar event is to actually, when the E3 comes in, is to draw that energy in and trip the upstream breakers. 
Now I have shown in a number of experiments that that is possible to do, but it's only possible to do if the product will survive long enough to draw that current in. Now that was one of my ideas with the EMP storm was to, to put in a special circuit there that would draw that current in and trip those breakers, right? Now, since that product's not gonna go to market, I looked for another solution, and this is the one I think that would do that. Now, it's not quite the EMP storm. It's not a three-stage product or anything like that. You have to address the threat differently, um, but it is a really, really good surge protection device with a lot of current capacity. It has audible warning and all those things. It's UL listed. It's made by a great company, and so it's the one I recommend, all right? The Siemens FS140. Now, I'm not making them. I could resell them as a courtesy to the customer. I looked into it. I can't really make any money reselling them. They're already resold all over the web. So I recommend you get them wherever you can. If, but I do think it's a great product, all right? They, they cost a couple hundred dollars, maybe $210 or something like that for the product. Um, and I think they're well worth it, all right? It's a very good product. And because it's built in you know, large quantities, you end up with a really good price on it. Now, I did take it apart, and I looked at all the components in it, and I did some analysis of them. And that's what really convinced me that this was a great product. They just have a lot of protection in this product here. So I, I recommend it, right? That's the Siemens FS140. So that's a piece of the solution, right? Get a really good surge protection device put on the home. If you have a different surge protection device that you like, and you, you know, for whatever reason you think, yeah, this is a great product, it's got good ratings, and, and you believe in it, don't pull it off and put another one on. Keep the one that you have, or use a different one if you like. This is just the one I'm recommending. You don't have to have this specific surge protection device for the general protection to work. You just need to have one that can draw a lot of current into it, okay? All right. The other piece that you need, though, for this to work and be effective is you have to address that E1 pulse. And the only way I know to do that effectively is to put a ferrite on each of the incoming power wires, right? Now, that's probably three wires if your house is wired like mine is, uh, but it could be four wires. So you want to take a look at that before you order them. Now, don't just go out and buy any arbitrary ferrite or even just think you can just buy a ferrite off the shelf and it will work because it won't work. If you run the analysis or you write the manufacturers, they'll tell you it won't work. You have to buy a special ferrite and you have to modify it. Each ferrite has to be custom modified to be able to work for this application, all right? I won't go into the details of modification. It's not worth the trouble unless you're an engineer. It wouldn't really make a lot of sense to you. But suffice it to say that if you don't get a custom modified special ferrite, it will saturate and it won't do the job, all right? The parts themselves are pretty expensive. Uh, and then they have to be specially modified. So it's, they're going to be rather expensive. My guess is you can get three of them for, oh, I don't know, $140 or something like that, all right? If time you run the numbers of getting them modified and shipped out, it's something like $140 for three of them. Um, and so I'll offer the complete solution with the ferrites and the surge protection devices. If you want to buy little ferrites that just go you know, on your radios and on your laptops and stuff, those are already on disasterpair.com. And there's a number of different sizes. Just make sure you get the right uh, dimensional size one that will fit around the wire bundle, okay? And then you just clip them around the wire bundle and that helps protect against the energy that might couple into the house wires and flow up into those parts, all right? So that's the solution, all right? Uh, the particular surge protection device I like, the ferrites that I'm going to offer, and then if you want to get some small ferrites to put on the parts, uh, those are recommended as well. All right, thank you very much. If you have some questions, write them in the comments. I know there's a lot to talk about here and I'll do my best to try and answer them.